Hello, everybody. Welcome into another episode of the Fantasy Pros Football Podcast. I am Ryan Warmly, joined as I am every Friday morning by Matthew Friedman and Andrew Erickson. Friedman, the Colts played last night and also Jonathan Taylor didn't play, so you are not required to take him as low-hanging fruit this week. How does that feel? That feels pretty good, although uh, this is a a tease, a very professional tease for the end of the show. Maybe we actually still will end up somehow having to talk about Jonathan Taylor. You You should be hosting the show and not me with teases like that. Erickson, can you believe we are already here in week five of the 2022 season? No, I cannot believe it. The season has been flying by, but that's what happens when you're just on the grind every single week. Waiver wire, doing the trades, start sits. You gotta love it. Let's jump into a deep dive on last night's Thursday night's football game. Just kidding. I will not make anybody relive that again. Let's make sure everybody can find the three of us online. Erickson's Twitter handle is at Andrew Erickson underscore. Friedman is at Matt F. The Oracle. I can be found at Ryan Warmly. And of course, we can be found everywhere online at Fantasy Pros. Before jumping into the show, let's take a second to talk about my playbook. If you want the best possible edge over your league for the rest of the season, my playbook is the number one in-season toolkit to help you manage your fantasy football lineups, make the best decisions, dominate your leagues just sync your league with my playbook today and get access to custom advice player news stats and projections waiver and lineup suggestions a trade analyzer a trade finder and so much more check out my playbook at fantasypros.com slash my playbook or download our fantasy football my playbook app in the app store or google play Keep in mind that you have to go premium to get the most out of my playbook. So if you're not currently a subscriber, we've got an amazing offer that gets you premium for six months without paying us a dime. You can check out that deal at fantasypros.com slash offers. Guys, we have another London game this week. Last week, there was a lot of teams that were kind of iffy because they might have had Alvin Kamara in their starting lineups, and then he didn't play super early in the morning. If you have autopilot with Fantasy Pros, that's not a problem. Giants at Packers is our London game this week. Erickson, what is the key matchup? I'm looking at the Packers running game against this Giants defense. The Giants don't have a great run defense, so I do think that Aaron Jones and both A.J. Dillon can feast in this matchup. You look at Big Blue, they rank bottom five in total rushing yards and yards per attempt allowed this season. But the thing that's kind of keeping them upright is they've only allowed one rushing touchdown. But that's not something that's necessarily sustainable with the amount of yardage that they're giving up every single week. Every other defense that ranks in the bottom five in terms of total rushing yards has led at least five rushing touchdowns. So I don't think it's going to last. They're going to give up touchdown scores to both A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones here. Packers are a run-heavy offense. They rank bottom five in early down neutral pass rate this season. They're heavy home favorites home as they are playing in London as the home team but I'm just excited to see two teams with winning records go toe-to-toe for the first time in London even though the Giants are I would say fraudulent at three and one yeah it's hard to believe this is the first time we've got two winning teams over there this is the Packers first trip to London is that does that sound right Rodgers Rodgers okay yeah it's it should be a fun one uh with the quote-unquote two winning teams Freeman what are you looking at yeah, I'm looking at the opposite side. This is a running back game, uh, Saquon Barkley against the Packers run defense. If you look at our betting pros odds page, Barkley is the clear front runner to win comeback player of the year and very deservedly so. He's number one in basically every stat there is. Uh, Danny Kelly from The Ringer had a great tweet highlighting all of the areas in which Barkley's number one. Uh, number one with an 88% snap rate. 84 rushes, 463 rush yards, 342 yards after contact, 99 touches, 570 scrimmage yards, and 73% routes based on his team's dropbacks. Like Saquon is just number one all over the place. Uh, And our our fantasy football stats report, if you look at it, it's basically a a pay on to Saquon, just number one all over the place. And he he leads the Giants in receptions. It's not just that he's dominating through the, uh, the ground game, he's dominating in the air as well. And The quarterback situation for the Giants is pitiful. Daniel Jones has the ankle injury. In a normal situation, I don't know if he'd even be playing, but it's not normal because uh, the backup to Rod Taylor is out with a concussion. So I think the Giants will have a very heavy run attack and they're going against the Packers, who are number 31 in rush success rate allowed to uh, opposing offenses. So great matchup for him in what I think will be a very run heavy uh, format for him. In our consensus half PPR rankings for rest of season, Saquon is the number one running back. Do you agree with that, Friedman? 
yeah, I, I think he should be, especially now with Jonathan Taylor injured. And I can't believe it. Mention Jonathan Taylor. <laughs> Already at the beginning. We'll see if we can get one in later as well. Let's move to the actual early afternoon slate. First game on the slate. Also our first pick on the over-under challenge. The over-under game is sponsored by No House Advantage, who are giving away $10,000 in weekly and season-long prizes, including a grand prize of $3,000. Check them out today at nohouseadvantage.com or download the app on the app stores. Use promo code PROS at sign up for a first deposit match up to $50. Our first over under challenge of the day is Devin Singletary over or under 11 and a half fantasy points against the Steelers. So be on the lookout for that as the guys share their picks for Singletary and also some of their other favorite over unders from this week's challenge throughout the show, which listeners can find at fantasypros.com slash challenge. But for now, let's turn to Erickson for his key matchup in Steelers bills. Looking at rookie quarterback Kenny Pickett making his first NFL start against the Bills as 14-point dogs. I, I mean, this is just, I, I couldn't couldn't really ask for a worse spot for Kenny Pickett, honestly, to make his first in his NFL debut here against the Buffalo Bills. Like, so he was repla- he replaced Mitchell Trubisky in the second half of last week's game. And in his first actual play, it was converting on a fourth down. So it was interesting to, to see them leverage his legs. He ended up scoring two rushing touchdowns during that game. He also completed 10 of 13 passes for 120 yards, 9.2 yards per attempt. He was a little bit more aggressive down the field. Looking back at last year, Big Ben, he had one game last year with nine point yards per attempt. One game. Kenny Pickett's already done that in just his first NFL action. So you're seeing the offense try to throw the ball down a little bit more aggressive, charting some of these receivers. Even on Kenny Pickett's first throw, it was intercepted by Chase. It was uh, intercepted on a target to Chase Claypool, who I honestly thought should have came down with the ball. But what we're going to see here against this Buffalo Bills defense, uh, it's it's not going to be great, probably. Um, I just don't think that a defense that is basically allowing as many fantasy points per game to quarterbacks as Justin Fields is averaging is def would not define it as a quote unquote, how the kids say smash spot uh, for Kenny Pickett. I do think that he's going to struggle in this game. The bills can put pressure on him. The Steelers don't have a great offensive line, but as a quarterback with a little mystery to him, I do think that he's going to make some throws here and there. He's got weapons downfield and he's not afraid to throw and be aggressive. So I think there's going to be some turnovers, but I think he's going to also deliver some splash plays as well. Quickly, Erickson, which of the skill position players in the Steelers offense, so not Kenny Pickett, do you think will be most impacted by his presence? Is it George Pickens who got a lot of looks in in last week's action? I think so. I mean, you, you're you kind of buying into the narrative, okay, who did Kenny Pickett spend the most time with during training camp? It was George Pickens, who was not necessarily viewed as a starter from the get-go. So we saw the connection between the two. Pickett, or uh, excuse me, George Pickens had 71 receiving yards on a team-high four targets from Pickett in last week's game. Pat Fryermuth also got a lot of looks, so I think it's going to be Fryermuth and George Pickens that actually see a lot of volume in this game with the Steelers most predictably trying to catch up against this Bills offense. Yeah, Freeman, 14-point favorites the Bills are. Is this a smash spot for everybody? Yeah, I mean, I would say, except uh, Devin Singletary, I actually will be taking the under on the 11 and a half fantasy points in the no house advantage contest because I think it's a passing game for the Bills, you know, per usual. That's just, that's how they run their offense. And, you know, that means I'm looking at Josh Allen going against the Steelers pass defense. This Bills offense is top five, uh, top five in drop back success rate, drop back EPA, pass DVOA, like they're obviously great this but this Sears version of Josh Allen it's interesting he's been effective but also attacking less downfield he's been more systematically taking what the defense has given him and that means he matches up really well against the Steelers defense which is number 20 in drop back success rate so the Steelers defense they're just allowing teams to progress down the field play by play and stay on schedule against them so a nightmare matchup for them against Josh Allen, who's been doing that really well this year, and they're injured. I mean, obviously, edge uh, rusher TJ Watt, he's out, but it's also the secondary. Uh, Number two cornerback, Akella Witherspoon, he missed week four. He didn't practice at all last week, so he's not certain to play this week. Strong safety Terrell Edmonds exited week four with a concussion, and then you have number one cornerback Cameron Sutton, who's dealing with a hamstring issue, and free safety Minka Fitzpatrick, who's dealing with a knee injury. So, it's a bad situation for the Steelers. Great situation for the Bills, as Erickson mentioned. 14 point slate high, 14 point home favorites. And uh, he's the MVP front runner. Uh, as the kids would say, a total smash spot for, uh, for, for Josh Allen, which means downstream benefits for everyone in the Bills offense, especially the receivers, but not for Devin Singletary. Erickson, I didn't catch. What was your Devin Singletary pick? 
Yeah, so I actually like the, the over on, on Devin Singletary's fantasy. Pro- I just, I, I think that he's the bell cow in their offense. Like, they're not using any of the other running backs. They're not using Zach Moss. They're not using James Cook. So if they are trying to get out of the game after they put up points, I think it's going to be the Singletary show putting up points in the fourth quarter. And I also do want to hit on Gabriel Davis's uh, under over prop there. I, I like his over because he's finally healthy. Like, that's been the biggest issue with him. Not been healthy with the ankle injury. So I'm going to go over 10 and a half fantasy points for Gabriel Davis with some question marks about how healthy is Dawson Knox. Isaiah McKenzie is still going through the concussion protocol. They lost Jameson Crowder. So I think besides Stephon Diggs, going to be Gabriel Davis that eats in this matchup. You can tell Erickson isn't a huge better because he called it an under over instead of an over under. Let's move to game number three. Lions at Patriots. Friedman, what's the key matchup? And is it a revenge game for Matt Patricia against the Lions? <laughs> It's revenge for everybody all the time. That's just the way that I live my life. But that's maybe more of a me thing than everyone else. Uh, Yes, it's the Lions rush offense. Get excited uh, against this Patriots rush defense. Uh, Even without number one running back DeAndre Swift, who's dealing with shoulder, ankle injuries, I think the Lions are going to run successfully against the Patriots defense, which is not coordinated by Matt Patricia because he's on the offensive side of the ball somehow. Uh, But this Patriots defense, it's number 31 of both rush DVOA and rush rush success rate like they just give it up to a, opposing running attacks that's just the way that their defense is structured and the uh the lions they've had some injuries on the offensive line but i'm not really worried about that center frank rag uh he's had this um this cycle in practice of not practicing on wednesday limited practice on thursday full practice on friday we saw that last week when he played. We're seeing that this week. So he's going to play on Sunday. And then left guard Jonah Jackson, who's dealing with a finger injury. He didn't practice at all last week. He has practiced Wednesday and Thursday this week. So a real chance that he is coming back. So we could have the full defensive line, uh, full offensive line ready for the Lions. And then on the other side of that, the Patriots last week, they were without defensive tackle. <clears throat> I'm, I'm getting all verklempt about this. They were without defensive tackle, Lawrence Guy, uh, shoulder injury, and he's one of their main interior run stoppers. Uh, so he hasn't practiced at all this week. I doubt he plays, which means there's already a matchup disadvantage. And then we have the injury situations going in opposite directions. In our Fantasy Pros unit power rankings, the Detroit Lions are number three uh, with their offensive line. The defensive line for the uh, for the Patriots is number 26. So a really big discrepancy between the, the two units. And that means I expect the Lions to push the Patriots around and to control the ball via the ground attack. And that means Jamal Williams, baby. I think he's going to dominate. Uh, you know, we saw without DeAndre Swift last week, Williams was the guy, 109 yards and two touchdowns on 19 carries and three targets. He has a league high nine carries inside the five yard line. He's going to go off this week. Erickson, I know you're also looking at the ground game, but for the Patriots. Yeah, because the Patriots are going to be probably starting Bailey Zappi at quarterback. So I don't want to talk about him in this past. I want to talk about the running backs, Damian Harris and Ramondre Stevenson, who I think are both excellent plays this week. The Lions, we talked about how bad the Patriots run defense is. Well, hold my beer. The Lions rank dead last in rushing defense EPA this season because they are equally as bad, and especially in the red zone. Second worst red zone defense allowing opponents to score on 88% of their drives in the red area into touchdowns. So I think both Stevenson and Harris can eat in this matchup. Each guy saw at least 18 touches last week with the Patriots playing with backup quarterbacks. Each saw a 50% opportunity share. They ran the ball on early downs on 62% of their plays, which was the second highest only behind the Atlanta Falcons last week. So look, Damian Harris does give the slight edge because he has been getting more of the red zone work than Stevenson. But if the Patriots are trailing in this game, Stevenson was Bailey Zappi's most targeted player. So I give the receptions and targets lean towards Stevenson. Erickson, sticking with you for the key matchup in game number four, Chargers at Browns. Yeah, we love talking about these running backs against these horrible run defenses, and that's the case here. Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt against the Chargers run defense. The first prop that I made this week was over on Nick Chubb's rushing prop. Like That was what I was looking for right off the bat. I was like, wait, where is it? He's playing the Chargers because the Chargers don't care about stopping the run. It doesn't matter who they have. They just don't prioritize it. They want to stop the pass in a pass-heavy league which is why they rank dead last in yards allowed before contact on their defensive line, 1.85. Like they're just letting teams run the football on them. And against the Browns, uh, that's not a good idea because they have the number one rushing attack in the NFL, the best advantage per PFF's O-line, D-line matchup chart as a result. So I think that both of Nick Chubb and Kareem Hunt can be played in fantasy. Nick Chubb is my number two running back ranked this week. And I expect them both to have some touchdown regression to kick in 
They went 0 for 4 on their carries inside the 10 yard line last week. So I don't think that's going to repeat. They're going to buy in the end zone this week. Ruben, what are you looking at? Looking at the other side, Justin Herbert against this Cleveland pass defense. The strength of the Chargers offense is the passing game. They're top 10 in pass DVOA and dropback EPA. Actually, number one in adjusted sack rate, even with the injuries that they've had on their offensive line. And the Browns are weak on the defensive line. At edge rusher, Chase Winovich is on IR. Jadavian Clowney still isn't practicing. I doubt he plays. Miles Garrett is still dealing with injuries from his car accident last week. Defensive tackle Taven Bryan has a hamstring injury that caused him to miss last week. And number one cornerback Denzel Ward is dealing with multiple injuries, back and rib injuries. Uh, so a, a good situation there for the Chargers offense going against a wounded defense. But the Chargers offense, it's also not intact. Keenan Allen. He's dealing with a hamstring injury. He hasn't practiced this week. He's probably out. Wide receiver Josh Palmer, he suffered an ankle injury last week. And tight end Gerald Everett, he popped up on the injury report yesterday with a hamstring uh, a hamstring injury. And like midweek soft tissue injuries, like that's never good. Like we need to monitor that today, but there's a chance that he misses this game. So the Chargers also might be limited. I have really no idea how this unfolds, but if the Chargers win, it will probably be because Herbert exploited the matchup that he has despite the situation and the injuries around him. Seahawks at Saints is our next game. Freeman, what's the key matchup there? I am looking at Geno Smith. I can't believe it. Geno Smith going against the Saints pass defense. The Geno Smith bounce back has been something to behold. He is number one in composite EPA and completion percentage over expectation. Like that is amazing. Uh, and he's done it with some softer matchups. So you, you take that into account, but he's got the wide receiver weapons to support legit high end production. If he is empowered to run a fast paced offense that lets him throw and that is what the Seahawks have let him do for the first month of the season. And, you know, based on what we saw on Thursday night football last night, not that I want to regurgitate that, but, you know, maybe it's not that Pete Carroll is opposed to a quarterback hooking. Maybe it's just that he knew Russell Wilson wasn't the guy he wanted in his kitchen, you know, like too many sharp knives, but the Seahawks, they're top six and pass DVOA drop back success rate and drop back EPA. Like they have been a legit passing attack through the first uh, the first four weeks, and now they get a tougher matchup. On the road, in New Orleans, early game, traveling west to east, and they have a defense, or they're going against a defense that has historically been pretty tough. Let's see how Geno does in this spot. This is a confirmatory litmus test type of game. If he goes off against the Saints, this is for real. And if he doesn't, it still might be for real. So it's fun to talk about how he's a big surprise, and it's been one of the fun storylines of the season, especially in contrast with Russell Wilson. Like you mentioned, but what actual ranking would you put to him right now? I mean, look, you just ask that question out of nowhere, which means I have to go into the ranker and sort of I, buy some I time have your ranking this. up here. You have him at 16. I have him at 16. This week. Yeah, he is... I think that's fair. He's like eminently streamable this week, even though it is a tougher matchup. Have you moved him up in the rest of season rankings? He He's currently 21 overall in the consensus. Yeah, I've, I've moved him up. You have to move him up just based on how he's performed. And also like the underperformance of some of the other quarterbacks we would have expected to do well. Erickson, what are you looking at in this one? I'm looking at Chris Olave against the Seattle secondary because I don't know if we're going to get Michael Thomas. Michael Thomas is not practicing again this week. And last week we saw that play out and Chris Olave was still the wide receiver one. Like nothing has changed about his status, whether it's James Winston, a quarterback, Andy Dalton, a quarterback, it doesn't matter. He led the team in targets last week for the third straight week, also scored a touchdown. And since weeks two, he's averaged just under 100 receiving yards per game, 200 plus air yards per game and a 30% target share. So Chris Olave against a defense that ranks last in pass defense EPA, allowing a league high 13.5 yards per completion. Chris Olave, you got to start him. Olave is currently 27th rest of season rankings. That's already up seven spots from last too week. Low. Sh too he low. should be even high. How high should he be? I think he should be in the top 24 at least. I mean, Michael Thomas, like this was the problem with him. He can't stay healthy. Like that's, and now he's hurt again. And why is he going to come back and just dethrone Olave? who was a first round pick with draft capital. But like, I don't think that's going to happen. Erickson, our next game up is Texans at Jaguars. What's your key matchup? 
Looking at James Robinson against this Texans run defense. I think this is a really great bounce back spot for the Jacksonville Jaguars offense, especially with their run game last week. It was basically a disaster against the Eagles. You saw Travis Etienne actually out snap James Robinson, run more routes, saw a target. But I, I just think that was the due to the game script. The, the weather, it just did not play into James Robinson's strength as kind of the early down back. And look, Houston Texans are the, the defense that you want to play for your early down running backs. Most rushing yards allowed per game to running backs this season. And I think Robinson has a little touchdown regression kind of going into his favor here. He has six carries inside the 10-yard line. And that's the most for any running back that hasn't converted yet for a touchdown on one of those carries. So I think Robinson scores in this matchup here and delivers for fantasy managers. Remember, top 10 running back for the first three weeks of the season. Don't bail yet. Really quickly, Travis Etienne did out snap him for the first time last week. Does that concern you at all? I mean, not really. I mean, Jamal Agnew also scored two touchdowns. Like, should I be like factoring in how he plays? Like now, if he's more involved again, like with Zay Jones back, potentially, I think that is a red flag, but I need to see more. I need, we need to see more of ETN with the touches just to really put him over James Robinson at this point. Friedman, what's your matchup here? I'm looking at Brandon Cooks going against this Jacksonville secondary. Cooks has 36 targets in four games this year, just 215 yards and a touchdown. But compare that to last year in his final four games, and those are the four games he played with Davis Mills returning to the starting lineup. Uh, 36 targets, same number of targets, 295 yards and three touchdowns. The real Brandon Cooks is probably in between, but the usage of nine targets per game, that is really attractive, too attractive to ignore. So it means you need to keep on starting Brandon Cooks, even though he probably hasn't lived up to your uh, expectations of him. I would say we should probably adjust expectations down in general because of that offense, but he still has a really high week to week floor because of the usage. The thing is he has a tougher matchup this week. The Jags are top eight in pass defense this year, middle of the road in fantasy points allowed to wide receivers. You got to start Brandon Cooks, but adjust expectations down just a little bit. Freeman, are the Jaguars the best team in that division? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, which is really amazing to say, but yeah, they are. Game number seven, Titans at Commanders. Friedman, what is the key matchup here? Uh, man, it's it's disgusting. One of these disgusting. I'll just say, uh, we're not even in the bye weeks yet. I feel like bye weeks are really when we start to see the disgusting matchups. But week five feels like it's the it's the in, it's the entrance way into the bye weeks, and we're already starting to see some of these disgusting matchups. And and we get that here with the Commanders. And I'm looking at the Commanders' defensive line against the Titans' offensive line. And uh, I think the commanders are going to dominate at the point of attack here. Uh, even without edge, Chase Young, who you know has the knee injury, uh, the commander's defense has been really strong in the front. Uh, number nine in adjusted sack rate and top eight in every key rush efficiency metric. And you compare that to the Titans offense, which is not even average in adjusted sack rate. Their offensive line is dealing with some significant injuries and not even average in any rushing efficiency metric. And in our fantasy pros unit power rankings, we see that the commander's defensive line has a significant edge over the Titans offensive line. We have the defensive line ranked number 14, Titans offensive line number 27. So I think this means that uh, quarterback Ryan Tannehill, he's going to be under pressure for a chunk of the game. And Derrick Henry, I think he could struggle to find running lanes. And, you know, anytime Tannehill struggles to put up big fantasy numbers, it's not that much of a surprise, especially with that wide receiver unit. But Henry, I mean, he's looked good, like legit good the past two games. And that means overall his numbers for the season have been sort of typical King Henry type of numbers. But I think he could struggle in this game because of the matchup. Erickson, what are you looking at? I'm looking at the other gross side of this game with Carson Wentz against this Titans secondary. That is also gross. There's just a lot of gross parts of this game. Titans rate 29th in pass defense EPA, allowing the league's second highest passing touchdown rate and yards per attempt. So look, they're giving up big plays and Carson Wentz leads the NFL in, pass in passing air yards this year. Titans rank third in air yards face. So Wentz is going to be chucking the ball downfield. Will that result in good plays or bad? Probably a little bit of both. And I think that benefits Terry McLaurin, who ranks fifth in the NFL in deep targets this season. There is going to be no Jahan Dotson. So if McLaurin gets a bump in terms of target share, a bump in touchdown equity, McLaurin's a boomer bust guy. I think this is a week you do want to start him in the favorable matchup, but just know that he is boomer bust. So it's either going to be 30 points or three if Carson Wentz ultimately crumbles. I think most people are starting McLaurin. Would you also start Curtis Samuel? I mean, Curtis Samuels led the team in target share every single week. So as long as he checks out with this illness that's popped up on the injury report for him, I think Samuel is a go. 
Bears at Vikings. Erickson, what's the key matchup? I'm um, looking at Dalvin Cook versus Bears run defense because everyone just seems to hate Dalvin Cook at this point. Oh, I got to trade him. He sucks. He's not getting... Guys, he just isn't scoring any touchdowns. Like, that's the main issue here. Like, he's getting the workload. He's dealing with this shoulder injury, which did not look like it was inhibiting him last week. He still had 22 touches for 86 yards in the London game, but Alexander Mat Madison got the touchdown on just four touches. Like... Okay, he's just running a little unlucky. 85% opportunity share, was top eight for a running back in week four. So this Bears run defense. Last in total rushing yards allowed per game overall. It's a perfect bounce back spot. And you look at how this team gives up its points and touchdowns. Chicago, second highest rushing touchdown rate of the season. Like, if Cook is ever going to score touchdowns, this is the week. In DFS, overweight on Dalvin Cook this week. Are you trying to trade for Dalvin Cook right now? 100%. Raven, what's your matchup? Looking at the other running back in this game, Khalil Herbert going against the Vikings on defense. Now, I will say, number one running back, David Montgomery, obviously he missed last week. He didn't practice on Wednesday, did have a limited practice on Thursday. So we should check the injury reports later today. There's a chance he plays, but I still think the balance of probability is that he sits out one more week. If he's out, obviously we're going back to Herbert, who uh, was great last week, 101 yards on 19 carries and a target. In his six games as the injury fill-in for Montgomery, he has 578 uh, yards rushing, three rushing touchdowns, and then 80 yards receiving on 13 targets. And now he's going against a Vikings defense that is number 29 in rush success rate. Uh, really very little respect for the Vikings defense and their ability to stop the run. Uh, so I think that means we have a run focused game for both of these offenses, which means probably low scoring and pretty disgusting. Khalil Herbert is ranked 14th among running backs in the week five rankings. So definitely somebody you want to start there. Game number nine, Dolphins at Jets. Friedman? Yeah, Teddy Bridgewater going against the Jets pass defense. Uh, the, the pass, uh, the pass offense for the Dolphins has been fantastic. Like top five and pass DVOA, drop back EPA and success rate. You know the big question: How much of that is due to starting quarterback to a tug of Iloa, who you know obviously was great in college, high draft pick, uh, struggled earlier in the career with situations because of the offense and the hip injury, and now he's kind of coming into himself. How much of the offense is because of him, and how much of it is due? to new head coach Mike McDaniel and his system, how much of it is due to, you know, wide receiver Tyreek Hill, who just joined the team, and the maturation of second-year wide receiver Jalen Waddell. So not to take anything away from Tua, who has been great, but Bridgewater is a really good backup quarterback, and he's similar to Tua in his style of play. So I don't think they need to change all that much of the offense to accommodate Bridgewater. And, you know, McDaniel has had 10 days to plan for Bridgewater as the starter because they're coming off a of Thursday night football. The wide receivers are the same. They can still support Teddy. I think it's not that big of a drop-off from Tua to Teddy. And last year, Bridgewater was number seven in composite EPA and completion percentage over expectation. Last week, coming in in the middle of the game, he was really serviceable with 191 yards passing and a touchdown. The Jets' defense, number 29 and drop back EPA per play. Like, they are bad. We have at the site a matchup calendar that grades all of the matchups for every position one to five with their stars. This is a five-star matchup for Bridgewater. Uh, I think in deeper leagues or, you know, as a streaming option, Teddy is very startable this week. Yeah, I fully agree. I don't know that I'd be starting him in most one quarterback leagues, but any super flex league, I think he's a clear must start. I mean, he's the exact type of guy who might get dragged down by a poor supporting cast, but who will get a rise from a great supporting cast. And this is a couple of great skill position players on that offense. So I think he's eminently startable. Erickson, what are you looking at here? Well, uh, I'd like to point out that I am starting Teddy Bridgewater in one quarterback league. So I have the faith in Teddy B to deliver me to the promised land. So I'm, but not as much faith in this quarterback. So I'm looking at Zach Wilson against the Miami pass defense, specifically how often they blitz. Like that's the big issue for Zach Wilson. I'm afraid how he's going to perform against the blitz. Look at him last week when he was facing pressure three for 11 versus the blitz for 41 yards. Uh, very bad. Three for 13 went under pressure. Also very bad. But when he was kept clean, 15 for 23, nine point, yard, nine point 
yards per attempt and 206 passing yards. So Zach Wilson was like, if the Jets can keep him upright and not have him face pressure, he was able to matriculate the ball down the field, get it into his playmaker's hands. But when he faced the blitz specifically and was under pressure, like most young quarterbacks, Zach Wilson basically crumbled. Now he's been on the injury report this week with an ankle injury. So that is concerning if that's going to inhibit his mobility a little bit. Zach Wilson, I think I would want to play him over a guy like a Kenny Pickett if I'm desperate, but I I think that you're going to see a lot of mistakes from Zach Wilson. He was up and down in his first game back. He seemed to shake off the rust in the second half, 12 of 20 for 161 yards, eight point yards per attempt. But I think he's still going to make a lot of mistakes and I think Miami's going to take advantage of it. Do you think that Corey Davis is somebody we need to take more seriously now that Zach Wilson is back? Uh, no, I, I don't think that's really the case here. I know that he's had a connection with Corey Davis. Even if you look back at last year when Corey Davis was healthy, I just think the talents of Elijah Moore and Garrett Wilson are, are too good. I, I really think, I mean, he had one more target than Garrett Wilson did. And Corey Davis ran less routes than both Elijah Moore and Garrett Wilson. So I think the team is trying to put their best talent on the field with their quarterback to give him the best supporting cast. And I don't think that is Corey Davis. Before we move on with today's show, I'd like to take a moment to talk about breaks of God. Fantasy sports fans, what if you caught a break with the potential to net you thousands of dollars with less than a $100 investment? Well, we've got great news because breaksofgod.com is the place to catch that break. Breaks of God is the latest sports card collecting trend to catch fire, and it's how sports card collectors of all ages are building high-value card collections without huge investment or risk. It has quickly become a popular and economic way for sports fans to potentially get high-value or rare cards without having to buy an expensive box or case themselves. From football to baseball and everything in between, there are many slot options available for under $100 so you can get in on the big money action. With Breaks of God box breaks, all the cards are broken from sealed premium boxes live on Instagram, and the cards are shipped directly to you for free when the live break is over. Slots are limited, so act fast. To learn more about how you can hit big money cards and get 30% off your first break, go to breaksofgod.com slash pros. That's breaksofgod.com slash pros and get 30% off your first break. You can also follow them on Instagram at Breaks of God. Individual results may vary. There's no guarantee that past performance will be indicative of future results. Invest wisely. Next game and the last game on our early afternoon slate, Falcons at Bucks. Erickson, what's the key matchup? I'm looking at this Atlanta run game against this Bucks run defense because I think the Falcons can run the football against a vaunted Buccaneers run defense that I think is actually a little bit overrated. When you look at the Falcons side of it, so they're number one ranked offense in rush EPA and early downs this season, and they run the ball at the third highest rate on those downs. So teams know they're running the ball. Doesn't matter. They can't stop them. Tampa Bay is allowed four point yards per carry to allow to running backs this season per PFF's O-line D-line matchup chart. Atlanta offensive line has the fourth best advantage this week in the trenches. They have PFF's second highest graded run blocking unit. You know who has the number one? The Kansas City Chiefs, who just played this exact Buccaneers run defense, rushed for 189 yards in week four. So I'm looking at guys like Tyler Algier and Caleb Huntley to have productive outings here on the ground against this Buccaneers defense. Algier, I like a lot as a flex play in RB3. Mega producer at BYU. First in rushing yards after contact. Second in rushing touchdowns. Third in PFF rushing grade among FBS players with at least 150 carries. I know he split carries with Caleb Huntley last week, but he dominated the receiving usage. So I think he's going to ultimately dominate the snaps in this game. And my bold prediction was he goes over 100 yards in this matchup. Yeah, some of the names that you have ranked behind him in your running back rankings this week, guys like Cam Akers, Tony Pollard, Zeke, Rashad Penny, Chase Edmonds. So you're definitely very bullish on him. Friedman, what's your matchup to look at here? I'm looking at Chris Godwin going against this Falcons pass defense, which I think has been better than it has performed. Uh, It's 29th in dropback success rate, but 19th in dropback EPA. So it's very bend, but don't break. Not like uh, breaks of God. Shout out our our sponsor, (laughs) just breaking boxes all over the place. Uh, The Falcons don't allow a lot of big plays. That's my point. Uh, But you can move the ball against them. I think they're pretty strong on the perimeter with cornerbacks AJ Terrell and Casey Hayward, but you can attack them in the slot, which is where Godwin lines up the most. And they've just been rotating players in there trying to figure out who to play. Maybe starter Isaiah Oliver returns from the IR and is able to play. If not, Godwin will probably match up with CFL transfer D. Alford, who has allowed 1.75 yards per coverage snap and 10.1 yards per target this year. 
Godwin had 10 targets last week in his return to action. Since last year, he's averaged 9.3 targets across the 15 games he didn't leave early because of injury. It is a great spot for Godwin, who got in limited practices on Wednesday and Thursday. So, you know, seems very much like he's still uh, still slated to, to play, hasn't suffered any setback or anything like that. So I think it is a Godwin game, less of a Mike Evans game, which means I'm going under 14 fantasy points for Evans in the no house advantage contest. We're moving to the late afternoon slate and man, this is becoming like a weekly complaint. Why are there nine early afternoon games and only three in the late afternoon? I will never understand that scheduling by the NFL. Game number 11 is 49ers at Panthers. Friedman, what's the key matchup? Uh, looking at this Panthers rush defense against the 49ers rush offense, a disgusting game, right? Kyle Shanahan as a favorite, Matt Rule at home, like what could go right? But, uh, the, you know, one thing that might go right for the Panthers, uh, you know, they're an easy team to make fun of because of the collective incompetence of head coach Matt Rule, Ben McAdoo, Baker Mayfield, but they're actually good on defense. I think that is one thing that could go right for them in this spot. They're top 12 against both the pass and the run. And their run defense especially could help them keep this contest close. The, the 49ers, they're number six in rush rate, right? They want to run the ball. Their offense is predicated on being able to run the ball. But they haven't been able to do it all that well. They rank no better than number 20 in any rush efficiency metric. And it's not hard to understand why. They're hampered by injuries. Number one running back, Elijah Mitchell, is out. Backup running back, Tyrion Davis-Price, he's out. Running quarterback, Trey Lance, is out. They're also without starting left tackle, Trent Williams, and backup left tackle, Colton McKivitz. So if the running game can't get going, that's bad for the entire offense. If you have Jeff Wilson... You have to start him like you just you kind of have to based on the usage that he's getting since Elijah Mitchell went out. He's had 48 carries, five targets in three games in his 13 career games with 15 plus opportunities. He's had 16 and a half fantasy points with Wilson. You're chasing the opportunities and he's going to get those opportunities, but it's a tougher matchup and you should keep expectations in check. Man, that touchdown he scored on Monday night against the Rams. I knew he was super fast, obviously, but he just looked so much faster than any other ball carrier I've seen this season. That was ridiculous. Erickson, what's the matchup here? I'm um, not looking at DJ Moore, Baker Mayfield, because uh, they they had the chance last week to to do something and they didn't. So going to Christian McCaffrey against the 49ers elite run defense. 49ers rank second and fewest rushing yards allowed per game and fantasy points allowed to running backs. So Christian McCaffrey had just eight carries last week for 27 yards. So the team has shown a willingness. Hey, they can get away from him on the ground if it's not working. And I think that's what they'll potentially do here in a very tough matchup, even though CMC is PFF's third highest graded rusher this season. 49ers defensive line allowing a league low 0.86 yards before contact. So he's going to get banged up even before he can create some yards on his own. But what we saw last week, which was even better for fantasy, was he was finally getting targets. Like, fine, don't give him the ball on the ground. We'll take it. Nine targets, nine catches last week for 81 yards and a score. Just throw the ball to CMC every single time. That's the Panthers offense. Case closed. I got to say, I got to follow up there. The DJ Moore thing, this hurts. Like, <laughs> I'm out. Like, I, I'm done. I've, I've benched him in our internal Fantasy Pros League. Uh, part of it is because of the matchup. And part of it is just, it's, it's not him. It's the circumstances around him. This is like the Allen Robinson thing last year, except unlike Allen Robinson, he's not injured. He's fine with his contract. He's young. Like, it, this is just like a good player who's getting sabotaged by everything around him. But it's similar to Allen Robinson in that everyone still wants to think of this guy as a great wide receiver. And maybe he is, but we still just got to adjust the rankings, continue to move him down the rankings each week. I have him outside the top 36 this week. And it is painful because I still think of him as a top 10 wide receiver talent. But he is at this point, I think he's unstartable. And if you have to start him, that is a sign of how bad your team is. So he's unstartable, but is he droppable in a shallower league? <laughs> no, you, no, no, you can't drop him because of the regret that you will inevitably have when someone picks him up and then he somehow goes off. Where, if you could pick anywhere, would you like to see him traded to? Uh, I mean, I don't know. I, I can't think, I can't think on my feet. That Charger, I mean, Chargers. 
Chargers. Keenan Allen misses you, more time. You know, so. just like pulling this out of thin air, I'm going to say maybe the Ravens. I think that would be a pretty natural fit as well. He, <laughs> yeah. he also played at yeah. Maryland, so, you know, coming <laughs> home. Uh, game I, the, thing is, the thing is, I just want to – the Ravens, no, I don't want to see him go to the Ravens because he's not, he's not going to get the usage there that I want him to get either. I want him to go to Kansas City. That's I mean, where I, just, I want I him to go. I just want him to get an accurate pass. Like yes. I just want someone to throw the ball like in his radius. <laughs> Green Bay would be a lot of fun too, playing with Rodgers. Next game up, Cowboys at Rams. Erickson, what's the key matchup? I'm um, looking at the Rams offensive line against the Dallas defensive line because it's just a massive disadvantage for LA. LA has the number 32 ranked unit in pass blocking this season, which is why Matthew Stafford has been absolutely atrocious. He's the QB 26 overall in the year. He has scored less fantasy points than Baker Mayfield. Yeah, it, it's been really that bad for Matthew Stafford this year. So against Dallas, who has generated the league's second highest pressure rate, I want nothing to do with Matthew Stafford. This offensive line cannot block, and Dallas is going to be giving him issues all game long. So I do think that they're going to have to try to run the football in some capacity with Cam Akers and Daryl Henderson. Last week, they did nothing against the 49ers elite run defense that we just talked about, but Dallas ranks 27th in rushing EPA, allowing 4.8 yards per carry to a Mosey running back. So if the Rams offense is going to get on track at some point. They need to actually try to run the football a little more, take a little bit of the heat off of Stafford because this offensive line is not going to be able to pass block what Dallas is putting out there. Is the offensive line the biggest reason for Stafford's struggles? I think that it is because it doesn't let a guy like Allen Robinson get downfield and try to get open. Like it's just not letting him mani- like work down the field. I mean, all the, the passing game is Cooper Cup and Tyler Higby because Tyler Higby is just catching these dump offs because Stafford's got to get rid of the ball so quickly. So they don't have any threats. And I think that the offensive line taking a massive step back from being a good unit last year it is really hurting Stafford. Yeah, I think Allen Robinson's talent and age is not letting Allen Robinson get open downfield. <laughs> For even what's your key matchup? Uh, <clears throat> Ryan, I'm glad that you were the one to say that. So I didn't need to be the one to, to say that, uh, I'm looking at wide receiver CD lamb going against this Rams pass defense. Uh, I'm back on lamb, even with Cooper rush at quarterback for at least one more game. Uh, I very much like lamb in this spot. He started the season slowly had 104 scoreless yards on nine receptions and one carry in weeks one and two. Since then though, he's been very dominant. 14 receptions, 184 yards, two receiving touchdowns in two games. Uh, And for the year, he has a dominant 42 targets. Now, the Rams, obviously, they have number one cornerback, Jalen Ramsey. That said, even with him, they are still number 30 in pass DVOA against number one wide receivers. This is a great spot for him. I expect the Cowboys to throw because the Rams have a funnel defense that ranks number one uh, in rush EPA, but number 25 and pass EPA. So just in terms of the matchup, the Cowboys will be incentivized to be throwing the ball and they are road underdogs. So they're likely to lean more into the passing game. And the Rams are without number two cornerback, Troy Hill, and uh, their third and fourth cornerbacks, David Long and Kobe Durant. Uh, They both missed weeks three and four with injuries. They're both uncertain for week five. I mean, it's basically Jalen Ramsey and then dust out there in in the secondary for the Rams. And uh, that is not a viable situation. I think CeeDee Lamb very much exploits it this week. Last game on the late afternoon slate could actually be a really fun one if the Cardinals show up. It's Eagles at Cardinals. Kreven, what's your key matchup? I'm looking at the Cardinals run offense against the Eagles run defense. Now, the Cardinals have been something of a joke under head close uh, head head coach Cliff Kingsbury, they have the uh, the horizontal raid passing attack, but you know they've also been able to run the ball really well. And you know part of that is that Kyler Murray's a strong scrambler. Part of it is that the offense forces defense to spread out, which creates more running lanes for the running backs. Uh, so the Cardinals offense can still run the ball pretty well, and that Eagles defense, you know, they made a number of offseason moves to try to get better in run defense. They added in the draft defensive tackle Jordan Davis, phenomenal athlete. In free agency, they added edge defender Hassan Reddick. At linebacker, they added in free agency Kazir White and through the draft, N'Kobe Dean, who never should have fallen to the third round. Okay, even with all of those additions, the Eagles defense is still not good 
against the run defense. They're, you know, bottom 20 in every key efficiency metric. So let me, let me phrase that outside of the top 20 in all key rushing efficiency metrics. And the Cardinals are at worst an average run offense, but you know, they're number seven in rushing success rate. You know, when they decide to run the ball, they can do it well. Now, if a home team can run the ball with success, it can keep the game close, which means it has more opportunities to continue to run the ball. So I think people will downgrade James Conner because of the matchup and because of the spot, but I don't think we should downgrade him all that much. I think it's still a pretty decent spot for him. Erickson, where are you looking? I'm looking at Jalen Hurts and the pass catchers against this Cardinals secondary because I think that Hurts is going to shred. I, I really think this is going to be a massive game for him in his passing game. 28th in pass defense, EPA, the Cardinals are the season. They've allowed the most yards after the catch of any defensive unit. So that's something to really highlight here because Hurts ranks sixth in total passing yards after the catch this season, fourth in completion percentage above expectation. A.J. Brown, we know that this dude is a monster with the ball in his hands, fourth in the NFL in yards after the catch. But Dallas Goddard, surprisingly, no player has accumulated more yards after the catch than Dallas Goddard, except for Austin Eckler, who has a negative average depth of target this season. So all of his yards are after the catch. Dallas Goddard has been a monster with the ball in his hands, terrorizing opposing defenses. So I think that this is a massive game for Goddard as a breakout tight end. I think that he's going to score and be very productive. Sunday night football. I thought we'd never get to the Ravens game. It's Bengals at Ravens. Actually, one of the better matchups on the slate. It looks like going into the week. Erickson, what's the key matchup here? It's Joe Burrow against this Ravens secondary. I mean, if we just take a peek back at last year, uh, Joe Burrow averaged 470 passing yards against the Ravens in his two starts. Ravens rank last in passing yards allowed per game this season. Every quarterback they have faced has thrown for 300 plus yards aside from Josh Allen, who was playing in rainy conditions. So, and I think the biggest thing with Burrow, the people are questioning, oh, well, is the offensive line going to hold up? He's going to get sacked so many times. And yeah, he's going to get sacked because he holds on to the ball because he's waiting for guys to get open downfield. But the Ravens rank dead last in pressure rate at 25%. So, look, I know the Bengals' offensive line has struggled at times trying to protect Burrow. I think this is the best spot for them to keep him upright, which means Joe Burrow is going to shred. And maybe we finally get Jamar Chase to get some production to match the wide receiver one so far, T. Higgins. Yeah, the only thing I will say on the secondary is they didn't have Marcus Peters last year, which he can be an up and down player, but having at least a second cornerback that you would hope can think, go to the You think he's going to stop Chase? You think he's no, going to no, stop I Chase? No, no, I don't. I, I still have nightmares of Jamar Chase, 200 yard game, just absolutely shredding Marlon Humphrey in the Ravens secondary. But just pointing out that they do now have a guy who is an all pro caliber cornerback back. I do still think this pass offense for the Bengals is going to smash, but uh, it's a little different than it was last year. Friedman, what are you looking at? Looking at Lamar Jackson against the Cincinnati pass defense, uh, I think if the Ravens is having a somewhat limited passing attack because they don't pass all that often and, you know, they're very tight and heavy, but they're top 10 in key pass metrics, uh, you know, number five in dropback EPA, actually number one in pass DVOA. Uh, but, you know, the Bengals defense, it's also been top 10 against the pass. I will say, I think that's a little deceiving. I think this uh, this defense is, I'm not going to say they are soft, but they've had soft matchups. They've had games against Mitch Trubisky, Cooper Rush, Joe Flacco, and then Tua getting injured with Teddy Bridgewater coming in. So four consecutive games against backups or backup level players. So this this matchup for Jackson is really better than it seems on paper. And, you know, it's looking doubtful for number one wide receiver, Rashad Bateman, who's dealing with a foot injury, didn't practice on Wednesday and Thursday, a, a tougher situation for him without his number one receiver. But I think this game reflects on both sides. If Jackson does well without Rashad Bateman, it means that he could really keep up his MVP caliber performance for this season. If the Bengals do to Lamar, what they've done to all of these other quarterbacks, they might actually be a top 10 pass unit. Yeah, if I could give one piece of betting advice, and I heard this on another podcast, and I'm sorry, I can't remember which one, but the Ravens obviously have been very good in the first halves of games and then have struggled to close out on offense. The Bengals have made some great adjustments defensively in the second halves of games. They're averaging like three points a game in the second half or something like that. So I would bet on the Bengals' second half line when we get to halftime of that game. On Sunday Night Football, if you are so inclined, Monday Night Football, Raiders at Chiefs, another divisional matchup. Friedman, what's the key matchup? Uh, I'm going to be really original and say Patrick Mahomes. That's the guy. This is the low hanging fruit for the episode. Patrick Mahomes uh, going against this Raiders pass defense. Um, 
the Chiefs are seven point home favorites for a team to be favored by that much in division. Uh, it usually means means they can dominate through the air. And with Mahomes, obviously the Chiefs can do that. Uh, you know, no Tyree Kill. They're still top eight in all the key pass efficiency metrics this year. And the Raiders defense very much is not top eight against the pass. In our fantasy pros unit power rankings, Mahomes has a massive edge against the Raiders defense in general and the secondary in particular. We have Mahomes as the number two quarterback overall. I think he's still the number one quarterback in the league, but at a minimum, he's top three. But going against a Raiders defense that we have ranked 25th, the secondary ranked 29th, he has a massive head-to-head edge over the defense that he's facing. I think the Chiefs should be able to score at will. Last week, Mahomes, 23 of 37 for three touchdowns passing, you know, uh, 249 yards. That's not a lot, but not much was required out of him. He had the 34 yards rushing. And the thing is, he did it against a Buccaneers defense that is one of the top units in the league. Like, he is very much still Patrick Mahomes. Through four games, 1,100 yards passing, 11 touchdowns through the air to just two interceptions. And since his 2018 breakout MVP campaign, he's the number one quarterback in the league with uh, composite EPA and completion percentage over expectation. This year, number one in ESPN's QBR rank- ranking. He's like he's the best quarterback in the league right now. And the Raiders, they might be without uh, their top two cornerbacks, Rocky Sin and Anthony Everett. Uh, coverage linebacker Denzel Perryman, he's dealing with a concussion, not certain he's going to play. And they're number four in fantasy points allowed to opposing quarterbacks, uh, You know, looking at our fantasy points allowed report. So smash spot, as the kids say, for uh, for Patrick Mahomes. And uh, you know, kind of bigger picture, looking ahead to week six, the Chiefs host uh, Josh Allen. Uh, they are favored by a point. Well, looking at the odds page, it's, it's a pick them, uh, pick them to a point, but in the look ahead market. So that game is basically a coin flip in week six. If Mahomes goes off in week five, which, you know, just based on the matchup, based on the the Vegas odds we have now, he probably should. And then if the Chiefs win in week six, Mahomes will enter week seven as the favorite in the MVP market. And right now he's available at five to one on our MVP odds page at betting pros. I like that bet a lot. That is one that I'm making. Yeah, he hasn't. It's it's weird to think he hasn't won an MVP since that 2018 season. This kind of feels like it could be a year where everybody says, all right, we've looked at Rodgers. Lamar had that one year. We know Josh Allen's great, but we got to reward the guy who's been the best quarterback in football. Also, why is that game not in primetime next week? It's it's I, the 425 Eastern game. Why we, we have Denver in primetime again. We have Commanders Bears on Thursday Night Football. We can't get Mahomes Allen Commanders in primetime. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Eric Singh, what's your matchup here? I'm looking at Raiders RB1 Josh Jacobs against this Chiefs defense. Josh Jacobs has been unleashed over the last two weeks, especially in the receiving game. Looking at last week, he caught five passes on six targets, running around on 62% of dropbacks elite opportunity share 92 percent in week four they're not using any other running backs like zamir white had two carries brandon bold had one target in week four they are feeding josh jacobs and this matchup against the chiefs is exactly why we should expect jacobs receiving usage to continue the chiefs rank first and fewest rushing yards are allowed to running backs but allow the most receptions yards and targets to running backs this season and this isn't just a one-year thing Like the Chiefs, traditionally, their defense has always given up a lot of receiving usage toward the running back position. Josh Jacobs is trending up in that category. So he's an RB1 for me this week. Let's open up the mailbag here to end the show. And as always, it's a good time to remind the listeners that if they want even more access to our analysts, be sure to join us on Discord at fantasypros.com slash chat. A premium subscription will get listeners full access to our analysts through AMAs, stages, and more. Our question today, is trading for Jonathan Taylor advantageous at all? Is he a, quote, buy low? Friedman, I know you love talking about Jonathan Taylor. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I should just keep on saying, hey, uh, Jonathan Taylor, invest in him. Because at some point, you know, if you say the same thing long enough, you're going to be right. Uh, So, yeah, Jonathan Taylor, he's getting the usage. Um yeah, I think he is a buy low because who, especially because whoever invested in him, uh, they probably hate Jonathan Taylor right now. Uh, you know, like they're they're zero and four, and they're just desperate. So yeah, you can probably buy low on him because uh, if the usage is there, and I don't 
I don't see why it wouldn't be there when he comes back and the injury he's doing, which doesn't seem like it's going to be long-term. He still has a chance to bounce back. So Friedman says, if you keep saying the same thing over and over again, eventually you'll be right. Albert Einstein says that if you keep doing the same thing, expecting a different result, that's the definition of insanity. Yes. Friedman, Einstein, head to head. I'm not sure who I'm taking in that matchup. Erickson, what do you think? I, I'm less aggressive on trying to get Jonathan Taylor as a buy low. I think that he's a buy low candidate, but I think there are other running backs that aren't hurt that I could buy low on as well, like a Joe Mixon, like a Dalvin Cook. Like these guys are playing. Jonathan Taylor's never had a never missed a game until last night. That was his first game missed. So how is he going to handle rehabbing for the first time with an injury? It's a lower body injury, an ankle injury. We see the sap, the explosiveness from the running backs. What's Jonathan Taylor like? That's part of his game is being an explosive guy with the ball in his hands. So I'm a little less aggressive on Jonathan Taylor because I think there are other buy low options at running back that I'd rather go after first and then look at Jonathan Taylor a little bit later. So Erickson, Saquon is now number one in our rest of season running back rankings. Jonathan Taylor only fell to number two. Do you think that's too high? Because if it's not, then he seems like a clear guy to go after. Yeah, I think it probably is a little too high. I, I mean, like he was the you know consensus one on one across the board for, for most drafts. But I mean, through four weeks, he really hasn't done a lot. And I mean, this Colts offense, it's not great. Like this offensive line has definitely taken a, a massive step back from where it was last year. So I, I could see a lot of running backs at this point out producing and out finishing Jonathan Taylor on a per game basis to finish out the year. Friedman, where did you say you would have him rest of the season? Uh, I think he's still number two um, because whenever he comes back, he's a pretty safe bet to get 20 opportunities in every game. And he's still one of the most talented running backs in the league. So I think, you know, I can understand being a little pessimistic about that offense, about when he returns, the usage he might have, his efficiency, but that can take you only so far. Like no, no way should he be outside of the top five. You know, like you can, you can sort of debate uh, number two, number three, maybe behind Christian McCaffrey, like that, that's fine, but he shouldn't, he shouldn't be down your board. Let's wrap it up there, fellas. Thank you both for another awesome episode. Everybody listening, please remember to check out my playbook on Fantasy Pros this season <clears throat> to make sure you're giving yourself the best possible chance to win each and every week and also our opportunity with Breaks of God. Most of all, thank you, the fans, for listening. For Friedman and Erickson, I'm Ryan Warmly. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for tuning in to the Fantasy Pros YouTube channel. Don't forget to check out our featured videos, and while you're at it, make sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Fantasy Pros so you can get the latest news and updates to give you the edge you need in your fantasy league.